Thank you. We're going to start just a couple of minutes before six, oh, but it's year. a full crowd, and we don't want to get too warm in here. It's a little, a little warmer outside than we had anticipated. Uh, welcome to Stoneham Bank. Thank you for coming very much. My name is Jim Smiley. I'm a financial advisor here at Stoneham Bank. I've been here 17 years. I, I see a lot of familiar faces. I see some clients and, and some uh, bank clients that, that I recognize. Um, thank you again for coming. This is an event that uh, put on by Stone and Bank for your benefit. So we, we do a lot for the community. We uh, give a lot back to the community. We are a community bank. So if we don't have stockholders, we're, we're owned by our depositors. And uh, you probably know that we've been in Stoneham for 138 years. So uh, thank you. We're very proud of that. Um, tonight we're having a, a, a social security seminar and here. It, it's for information for you folks. So there'll be a lot of information, probably come pretty fast. I'll let Kurt talk about questions, you know, some of, some of the questions you can stop, my guess is, Kurt, but other, if you have a personal situation, there'll be time after this to come up and ask Kurt a personal question. A very, a very uh, uh, no, a usual one is, I worked, in the public, I worked in the private sector, then I switched to the public sector. I'm not 100% clear on how that's gonna work when I get to Social Security. That's an unbelievably common question. Kirk could probably talk about that with you because it, it comes up every time. Um, yeah. My my job here at the bank and hit my partner right here, Eric, Eric Bergstrom. We're both financial advisors here at the bank. So, there's about 24 seats still available. Um, how we help clients here at the bank is you may be thinking, well, I, you know, thinking about starting taking Social Security. And how, how does that interact with my retirement plan I have at my work or I have that have are accumulated already? I may have a 401k or an IRA. That's where Eric and I come in uh, on that part of the equation. We can help you with recommendations, give you your choices, your options of what you can do, what you don't have to do. But we're here for you, so we're part of the bank. We're here to answer those questions. We're both registered representatives, we're, you know, both licensed uh, stock advisors so we can help you with those questions but that's not what it's here today is tonight tonight is about you and your questions for social security we wanted to introduce ourselves to let you know that we're a resource here i can give you my card eric has his cards if you need it but if not please enjoy the seminar uh, i'm going to introduce kurt sarnowski of sarnowski consulting uh, kurt and i have known each other for a long time um, he's done this seminar for our community uh, both here and in delrica at our other branch um, for 15 years? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, there are, the seminars are always interesting. Kurt spent his entire working career at the Social Security Administration, so you're getting it right from the source. He, he Not only does he know the information, he was there when they drafted the legislation, so he'll give you that information. Well, I understand you were here when the bank opened. Uh, <laughs> 1977, Jim, so here we go, right back at you. I, I, I told you we've known each other a long time. So. <laughs> So without further ado, Kurt Zarnowski Thank from Social you, Security Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank Good to be here. As Jim said, Kurt Zarnowski, currently the principal in Zarnowski Consulting. For those one or two in the room not intimately familiar with us, always proud to say we're an international consulting firm whose world headquarters are conveniently located in the basement of my house in Norfolk, Massachusetts. But don't worry. At Zarnowski Consulting, we'd like to say we provide expert answers to your Social Security questions. Why can I say that? Well, simple as Jim reference. I worked for the Social Security Administration for 34 years. The last 20 years of my career there, my job was the communications director here in New England, which meant I spent my time, as our Canadian friends would say, oot in a boot, talking to people about the Social Security program. And in my retirement, such as it is, I'm actually in my 13th year of continuing to do that same type of work, largely because I enjoy the heck out of it but also because I believe there's a real need for the information. Believe it or not, each and every month, the Social Security Administration pays over $110 billion in benefits to over 65 million people. And on top of that, there's another 183 million folks like you in the room who are out there working and paying into the program right now. And what I've seen with my time at the agency, despite the age of the program, despite the size of the program, and frankly, despite the economic impact that Social Security has in this country today, unfortunately, the myths and misunderstandings that are out there about what it is as well as what it is, they're staggering. 
Nobody knows nothing about the program as best I can tell, so I was excited to accept Jim's invitation to spend the next seven or eight hours with you. <laughs> Slowly, painstakingly, carefully. <clears throat> All right. Spend about 40 minutes or so talking about some of the things I think it's important for you to know about what the program is, and perhaps equally importantly, what it isn't. And why it's so important these days? Simple two words. Baby boomers. And 75 million boomers storming towards retirement. Just now starting to wake up to the fact the retirement world staring us in the face is different than the retirement world that faced our parents and our grandparents. We're starting to recognize that the social security program as a guaranteed stream of lifetime income may well be a bigger part of our retirement income than we had ever anticipated. We're also recognizing, well, maybe we don't know as much about the program as we should. So in our time together tonight, give you some good solid information to help you better understand what the program is, recognize what it isn't, dispel those myths and misunderstandings that are so prevalent, and set you down the road to the comfortable retirement we all hope to enjoy. Most important slide in the presentation is gonna be this one. You can re-reference it on numerous occasions. Need to recognize when Social Security was created about 87 and a half years ago, the program we put in place simply to provide you with a base or a foundation of income that you can count on being there for you, but it's a base of income protection that you must take steps to supplement because your Social Security payment was never intended to be your only source of income in retirement. But unfortunately these days, about 21% of retiree couple households, the Social Security money they get each month is virtually the only income they have. That's a terrible situation. So how do you avoid that happening to you? Simple, by planning for your retirement. And you'd be commended, taking time out of your busy schedule, spending a little time with us this evening, planning for this aspect of your retirement, the Social Security program. Now, for the longest time, the Social Security Administration oops, sorry, tried to play a proactive role in helping you plan for your retirement. Because you may recall, back in the day, Social Security used to mail a paper document on an annual basis to anyone who was 25 years of age or older. That Social Security statement started going out back in 1999 and designed to show up in your mailbox about three months before your birthday, again on that annual basis, providing important retirement planning information. Give you benefit estimates at three different ages, 62, your full retirement age, 70. I'll talk in a second why those are important ages. The other thing the statement did that was so important was provided you with a nice year-by-year -year breakout of what the Social Security Administration had recorded as your work and earnings under the program. We'll see in a little bit what you collect eventually is directly related to what your work and earnings have been. So when you get that statement each year, it's important to review the earnings, make sure they were correct, and if they weren't, catch it and correct it, because if you didn't, have a direct impact on what you would eventually receive. <laughs> We have noticed, hey, I haven't got one of those every year lately. What's the deal? Well, Social Security has significantly altered distribution plans for Social Security statements. The big news is they no longer mail paper documents on an annual basis to everyone 25 years of age or older. Said what they've done first and foremost, put in place a system whereby if you go to www.socialsecurity.gov slash my account, take about 15 or 20 minutes or so to set up an individual my Social Security account for yourself, an important byproduct of having that account in place is you'll then be able to download through a secure website a social security statement for yourself whenever you need one or want one. You're gonna come in, meet with Jim, meet with Eric, do some retirement planning. Being able to bring a current social security statement to that session is gonna make it a far more worthwhile exercise. So homework assignment for me to all of you tonight. If you have not yet set up your individual My Social Security account, please do so. Down the road, once you start to collect benefits, a lot of advantages flow from having that account in place. But prior to retirement, the biggest advantage is that ability to access a social security statement whenever you need one or want one. And again, you need to plan for retirement. By the way, Social Security has announced they've decided to resume mailing paper documents, albeit on a very limited basis. And what they say these days is, if you're 60 years of age or older, and have not yet set up a My Social Security account for yourself, they will mail you a paper statement, same old schedule about three months before your birthday. But that's it for paper mailings. If you're under the age of 60, the only way you get a Social Security statement is by setting up your My Social Security account. But my view is, even if you're over the age of 60, I think it makes sense to set that account up. Because again, gotta meet with Jim, meet with Eric, do some retirement planning, 
being able to bring a current statement to that meeting is going to make it a far more worthwhile exercise. So take advantage of that online social security statement. Use it as the tool it was intended to be. Help you recognize the program's going to get you here, but you need to work to find ways you can move what social security is going to provide you because it was never intended to be your only source of income in retirement. And so you recognize that for the good folks here, the more likely you are to have that comfortable retirement. Again, we all hope to enjoy. All right, let's talk about retirement benefits under the Social Security program. That's what most of the information and interest is these days, obviously, with baby boomers. Now understand this. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you what you should do. I believe entirely that it's your choice, your decision. After all, you're the ones who've worked and paid into the program. When I talk to folks, I see my role as helping you understand your choices and your options. In other words, helping you understand what you can do under the program. Because my view is, unless and until you understand what you can do, you're in a position to decide what you should do. So let's make sure you understand the choices and options that are available to you in terms of when to start collecting your benefits. Because that seems to be the most frequently asked question these days. And the place to start is by making sure you know what is called your full retirement age. When the program started back in 1935, Congress said full retirement age is the month you turned age 65. It was age 65 for everyone without exception. Continued that way, in fact, till 1983, when Congress changed the law, increased Social Security full retirement age for anyone born 1938 or later. Now this increase gradually been phased in over time. A big chunk of us baby boomers, and it was happened to be born between 1943 and 1954, our full retirement age was when we turned age 66. But it's important to note, under current law, it continues to increase. Tops out anyone born 1960 or later has a Social Security full retirement age as the month you turn age 67. Now understand this, collecting at your full retirement age month, it isn't your only choice, it isn't your only option. But make sure you know what your full retirement age month is based on your year of birth. Because you'll see as we go through the discussion this evening, a lot of features of the program do flow from at least having reached your Social Security full retirement age. So make sure you know what yours is. But in terms of collecting, you have to start the month you reach your full retirement age is one thing and one thing only. It means you'll receive 100% of the amount your work and earnings and time to collect. We'll talk in a second how that gets calculated. But starting at your full retirement age month, you get 100% of your benefit. But among the options you have are to start collecting prior to reaching your full retirement age month, if that makes sense for you. And on the rules these days, you can start to collect as early as the month you turn age 62, or at any point in between, by the way. And here's the thing, Social Security, as the name implies, is a social insurance program. And Congress has built certain social goals into it. And what is the hope that at the end of the day, based on average life expectancy, you'll end up with roughly the same amount of total lifetime benefits, regardless of when you start to collect. And so you have to start collecting prior to hitting your full retirement age month. Well then, because you're starting sooner, in theory anyway, you'll be collecting for a longer period of time, you'll find that that full retirement age benefit amount gets reduced. How much a reduction? Well, it's roughly half a percent per month reduction for each month prior to your full retirement age, you're gonna be collecting benefits. Half percent per month, roughly a 6% per year reduction by starting early. But you don't have to start right on your birthday. You don't have to start the first of the calendar year. Whatever point makes the most sense for you. So if you have to start prior to hitting your full retirement age month, you're going to see that full retirement age benefit has been reduced by roughly half a percent for each month you're expected to collect. And oh yeah, by the way, it's a permanent reduction. Now there are those myths that are out there. Too many folks I've talked to over the years mistakenly think, yeah, I know I'll start early, I'll get less. But as soon as they hit my full retirement age, my payment will bump back up, right? Uh-uh, wrong. Permanent reduction. Again, the idea being, if you're starting earlier, well then in theory, you're collecting for a longer period of time. You give it less than an individual monthly basis. But the idea being, though, that at 
average life expectancy, you'll end up with roughly the same amount of total lifetime benefits. Now, as I mentioned, full retirement age, you get 100% of your payment, but among the options you have are to wait past your full retirement age before starting, if that makes sense for you. And with that social insurance idea in place then, you have to, to defer a little bit. Well then by starting later, in theory anyway, you'll now be collecting for a shorter period of time. So by all rights, your payment amount ought to be increased if you wait. And it is. These are referred to as delayed retirement credits. And for each month past your full retirement age, you ought not to collect. That full retirement age benefit amount now gets increased by two-thirds of a percent. Two-thirds percent per month increase translates into an 8% per year increase by waiting. But again, you don't have to not collect for a full year. For each month past your full retirement age, you defer. That full retirement age benefit amount now gets increased by two-thirds of a percent. But here's the key thing. Delayed retirement credits only accrue from your full retirement age month until the month you turn age 70. Now understand this, under the rules of the program, you never have to take your social security benefits. It's not like there's a required minimum distribution like there is with your IRA or 401k or 403b. But if you opt to defer from your full retirement age month until age 70, you'll see that full retirement age benefit amount increase by two-thirds of a percent for each month you've opted not to collect. You opt to wait past age 70 before starting, if you're right to do so, but you'll see no additional increase by waiting past age 70. So let me give it, um, an example to illustrate what I'm talking about. Because somebody here at the full retirement age is 67. And let's say at her full retirement age is 67, she'd get $1,000 a month. The options that are available to her. Well, let's say she wants to start right at the earliest point, right at age 62. The way the reduction factor works out, she'll receive 70% of that full retirement age amount, meaning starting at age 62, doesn't get a thousand a month. No, she gets $700 per month and continue. Oh yeah, she's getting $300 less each month. The trade-off obviously gets that lower amount sooner. And in theory, again, we'll be collecting it for a longer period of time. She wants to wait, start at age 64. She'd get $800 a month and continue. At her full retirement age of 67, that's when she gets the full $1,000 a month that her work and earnings entitled her to. So she wants to wait a year. Start at age 68, because that makes sense for her. Payment at that point is going to be 8% higher, meaning her ongoing benefit, not 1,000 a month, no, 1,080 per month and continue. She waits all the way until age 70, the first for three years. She'll see that full retirement age benefit now has been increased by 8% for each of the three years she's waited, and it's simple interest, not compounded. But it means her payment starting at age 70, not 1,000 a month, no, 24% higher, it's $1,240 per month and continuing. Well, say she wants to wait and start at age 72. It's gonna be that same 1240, right? Because there are no additional delayed retirement credits past age 70. Bottom line is I started, your choice, your decision. But I want you to be making an informed decision. And one of the things that was in place, Congress designed it so based on average life expectancy, you'd end up with roughly the same amount of money regardless of when you started. But you know what, life expectancy is increasing. Social security numbers say 65 year old man today on average, will live to age 84. 65 year old woman on average, will live to age 86. But even more telling to me, Social Security numbers say of today's 65-year-olds, one in three expected to live to age 90, one in seven to age 95. We boomers and those that come after us need to recognize that for us, retirement could be a period of 20, 25, or maybe even 30 or more years in length. And my personal view tends to be that because for most of us, we head into retirement these days, if we have any type of pension at all, Far more likely to be the defined contribution type, right? 401k, 403b, 457. We're walking out the door, not with a guaranteed stream of lifetime income like you used to get with that traditional defined <coughs> benefit pension. No, just walking out the door with a pile of money. <coughs> and so it seems more likely to be that later in retirement, that pile of money will have diminished somewhat. Later in retirement, healthcare costs will most certainly be higher. 
So you may have a greater need for a higher monthly income later in retirement than when you make that initial transition. And one way you can help meet that is by delaying the start of your social security benefits. But again, it's not for me to say it's your choice, your decision. Oh, I want you to be making an informed decision though. And in simplest form, you start sooner, you get a lower amount for the rest of your life. You wait longer before you start, you get a higher amount for the rest of your life. But to me, the key thing is when Congress set the reduction rate and increase rate so many years ago, based on average life expectancy at the time, it was all supposed to come out about even. But these days, because life expectancy is increasing, maybe good things come to those who wait. But again, your choice, your decision. <coughs> that question? Yep. Just one quick question. What is the average payout in You'll get years? that in a second. Oh, you will. You'll get that in a second. All right, questions about the when you can collect? All right. So then I often get asked the question, well, I've decided to start collecting, but you know, then a period of time goes by and you change your mind. Do you have any options? Sure. I always like to remind folks the decision to start collecting Social Security retirement benefits doesn't have to be an irrevocable one. And you've got a couple of options that are available to you. It's important to understand what those are. So you start to collect. Collect, collect, collect. Six months go by, you say, you know, shoot, I shouldn't, I should have filed. I didn't, don't like this retirement thing. One of the options that people have is within 12 months of starting to collect benefits, you can, in essence, request a do-over. Technically, the term is you withdraw the application that you had submitted to Social Security. You say, I changed my mind. Now, for Social Security to grant that withdrawal request, you need to do one thing and one thing only. You need to repay any benefits you may have collected. Now, the key thing is, though, Social Security doesn't charge interest. You simply repay the principal. And once that check is cleared, as if that earlier application has never occurred, you're free to reapply at whatever point makes the most sense for you and your benefit rate is gonna be set as of the new application date. Now, key thing is, you have to do that within 12 months of collecting any once in a lifetime. All right, so this ability to withdraw, repay, and reapply, and exercise it within 12 months of starting and once in a lifetime. But let's say you started to collect, a couple of years go by, and you go, shoot, I made a mistake. Do you have any other options? Yes. Under the rules today, once you have reached your Social Security full retirement age month, one of the options that's available to you is to request something called voluntary payment suspension. Meaning, you just call up Social Security and say, in essence, I want a timeout. By doing that, Social Security will stop your payments, effective with the month after the month you contact them. But now, because you're over your full retirement age, you're back in the business of accruing delayed retirement credits. And your benefit rate, whatever it happens to be, will now grow by 2 thirds percent per month, 8% per year, for as long as you opt not to collect right up until age 70. Now, key thing is, you can stop and start and stop and start as many times as you might like between full retirement age and 70. I don't recommend doing that, it's an administrator cluster, but you're not locked out, for example, that you opt suspend at 67 or 68. It's not like you can't collect until age 70. No, you can stop and start as you choose. So again, this is an option that's available only after you've reached your full retirement age month. It is out there, it's a way you can undo what you've done, all right? Two options. Question. There's no repay after your full Absolutely retirement. Absolutely right, great, great point. This is entirely prospective. So you call them up and say, I want to stop my benefits next month? Absolutely, no requirement that you repay anything. It's all prospective, good point, thank you. All right, so we talked about the when you can collect. We'll spend a couple of minutes talking about how benefits are figured. There are a lot of questions about this as well. As I mentioned earlier on, there's a relationship between your work and your earnings and what you collect each month from Social Security. We'll just see in a second, it's not a perfect correlation. But in calculating benefits, Social Security simply uses a formula that Congress has written right into the law. The formula has a couple of different steps in it. First step is Social Security does go back and adjust all of your prior year earnings for inflation. Bring them up to what they are in today's dollars. But then once they've done that, they calculate your benefit by plucking out and averaging your highest, wait for it, 
35 years of work <clears throat> in the system. <gasps> and all those myths that are so prevalent. I don't know how many folks I've talked to over the years that say, oh, it's my high three, right? Or my last five, like some other pension systems? Uh-uh. Social Security benefits are calculated by everyone <coughs> gave. Lifetime of earnings. Because these days defined as your highest 35 inflation adjusted years under the program. So what happens if you don't happen to have 35 years when you worked and paid into Social Security? Taking time out of the workforce to raise kids, care for aging parents, or perhaps work for a while on a job where you weren't paying into Social Security. Unfortunately, no provision for that. Still going to be an average of your 35 highest years. And so if you don't happen to have 35 years of something, zeros get added in for those additional years, lowers your average monthly wage, and it lowers your benefit. Here's the takeaway for this evening. Another reminder about Social Security being that social insurance program that I mentioned. In putting the formula in place, Congress has recognized that people with lower paying jobs less likely to have a pension in retirement. Less likely to be able to save for retirement their own working years to need the money for food, clothing, and shelter. <coughs> so the formula is set up to try and help people in lower paying jobs by providing a benefit amount which is intended to replace a higher percentage of that person's pre-retirement income. Somebody in the 53% of what they're making in retirement. Now, for somebody who's been a higher earner throughout his or her working years, by all means, he or she receives more each month in absolute terms than the lower earner does. But if you look what the payment does, it's intended to replace a smaller percentage of what that person's making in retirement, somewhere around 33%. And for the average worker these days, a Social Security payment only intended to replace around 40% of what someone's making in retirement. In no case, high earner, low earner, or average earner is a payment intended to replace 100% of what you're making in retirement. It leads us right back to that first slide I showed you. The program is intended to provide you this base, this foundation of income, good solid base, good solid foundation, but it was never intended to be your only source of income in retirement. And sooner you recognize that, work with Jim, work with Eric to find ways you can move from what Social Security provides to where you need and want to be, well, the more likely they are to achieve that. Two numbers for you to think about this afternoon, or this evening. In 2023, the average Social Security retirement benefit being paid is $1,857 per month. $1,857 per month. Then I get asked the question, well, is there a maximum payment that Social Security makes? So we'll qualify it by saying, this year, 2023, for someone who is at his or her full retirement age, who, for each of the past 35 years, has had earnings at or above the taxable maximum level for each of those years. That's an important point. Each year, there's a maximum level of earnings that are subject to Social Security tax. You could make a half a million dollars this year, but this year, for example, you're only going to pay Social Security tax in the first $160,200 that you make. Anything you make above that, sure, you'll pay a 1.45% Medicare tax. But, <coughs> excuse me, but you won't pay the 6.2% Social Security tax. So when it comes time to average your earnings, to calculate your benefits, Social Security only averages in the earnings that have been subject to that Social Security tax. So to recap, 2023, somebody at full retirement age, who for each of the past 35 years has had earnings at or above whatever the taxable maximum has been, for each of those 35 years, this year he or she receives $3,623 per month. 1857 or whatever, average 3627, maximum full retirement age. Nothing to sneeze at, but a good solid base, good solid foundation. We need to find ways to supplement it because it was never intended to be your only source of income in retirement. Yeah? Is there a number associated with what Social Security considers a lower average? Yeah, higher? yes, there is. Oh, you want me to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> so, low earner on average. 27,000 and, and change. High earner, this isn't even a maximum earner. This is somebody making around $60,000 a year. Average earner, last time I looked, around $48,000 per year. Right? Again, these are earnings subject to Social Security tax. By the way, if I had been given the full eight hours, 
that he had originally promised him. <laughs> We'd be going through this in excruciatingly painful detail. And I realize there may be some of you in the room who are sorely disappointed that we're not. May have some, I don't know, engineers or whatever in the room. But if you want to learn more about benefit calculations and computation, Social Security's website has a great deal of information, www.socialsecurity.gov slash, and then in all capital letters, O, A, C, T, O, A, C, T. That's an abbreviation for the Social Security Administration's Office of the Actuary. Great deal of it. You all know what an actuary is, right? Yeah. Actuary is somebody who doesn't have enough personality to be an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's all right. I can tell that joke. The Social Security's chief actuary, a guy by the name of Steve Goss, told it to me. Hey, you know how you can tell an actuary is an extrovert as opposed to an introvert? If he's an extrovert, he's going to be staring down at your shoes instead of his own. Hello, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'm here for Thursday. Don't forget your waiters and waitresses. And oh, yeah, try that. Did you have a question? On on um, what level of earner you are, through your career, you've probably been a mix of maybe all three. How do they ca calculate that long term? I mean, you said over 35 years, you could have been in all three categories. Yeah, but don't forget, that's the, the, the levels I talked about are what they're at today. And so if you were historically a low earner, you were probably you know making $12,000 back in the day or whatever. So it's all based on your I life. Have. No, exactly. I know, I know. Yeah. So it's all based on an average of your lifetime of earnings. For an average earner, what did I say? It was around forty, forty-eight thousand yeah. dollars or whatever. So that's the equivalent. Back in the day, you were making the equivalent of what today's forty-eight thousand. So it, com it it calculates that. Absolutely, that, that absolutely. Is. Adjust it upward. Yep. Yeah. Quick, quick question: If you're getting the high earner and you're collecting Social Security. Yep. Yeah. And can you still work? Full we'll time? talk about that in two slides. Okay. Good question. Good question. All the time. Yeah. Um, a quick clarifying question on the 35 years. Yeah. Did you say it was the past 35 years or your highest 35 years? It's your years? highest 35 regardless of when they occur. Not necessarily your first 35, not necessarily your last 35, not even necessarily 35 consecutive years. All right. Your high 35 regardless of when they occur. All right. So, thank you for the intro back there. Let's talk about working in retirement. Another area where people have lots of questions. And yet another area where it's vitally important to know what your full retirement age month is. Because under the rules of the program, if you're under your full retirement age, looking to collect Social Security benefits, but intending to work at the same time, you need to understand that you're limited and how much you can earn before it begins to impact your ability to collect. 2023, this year, under your full retirement age, you're allowed to make up to $21,240 <coughs> without any loss of benefits whatsoever. Now you make above that, doesn't mean you can't necessarily collect, but Social Security is required to then start holding back $1 in benefits for every $2 that you're over the threshold. So what counts towards that 21240? Two things only. Wages or net income from self-employment. In other words, earned income only. Unearned income, like a VA benefit, 401k distributions, bank interest, dividends, public pensions, private pensions, none of that counts. Earned income only. The great news is from the month you reach your full retirement age, though. There's no longer any earnings limitation imposed whatsoever. From your full retirement age month on, you can work and earn as much as you'd like and collect full Social Security benefits at the same time. Now, how many times I've been asked the question, hey, yeah, I've been retired for a couple of years, I'm collecting benefits, but I'm going back to work. I'm not gonna have to pay Social Security tax on my earnings, am I? Arrgh. You earn a job covered by Social Security, you will absolutely pay. Social Security tax and those earnings. Good news for the good folks at Social Security, because they can use the money these days, right? <laughs> but there's potentially good news for you. As I mentioned, your benefit is always calculated by averaging your highest 35 years of work under the system. As I just mentioned, it isn't necessarily your first 35, and necessarily your last 35, it isn't even necessarily 35 consecutive years. So even if you're retired, Living fat and happy, you go back to work, pay into the system. At the end of the year, you file your tax return. Well, the good news is Social Security later that year will automatically do a match. 
They'll compare your new year of earnings with the lowest of the 35 years they've been using up until that point. And if that new year of earnings is higher than the lowest of your 35, you're going to see a benefit increase. They drop out the low year, plug in the new year, your benefit increases going back to January of that year. The other bit of good news about working, frankly, this ability to increase your payment through additional work and earnings, it continues forever. Delayed retirement credits, that bump because you haven't received anything, yeah, those stop at age 70. But no matter how old you are, if you're working, paying into the system, and your earnings are higher than the lowest of your 35 years, you're going to see a benefit increase as a result of that additional work, no matter how old you are. And frankly, the other bit of good news about work after full retirement age, it really never hurts. You've been a high-priced executive, but in retirement, take part-time job at the local golf course driving the beer cart. At the end of the year, you make a couple thousand bucks. Well, a couple thousand bucks probably got to be lower than the lowest of your 35 years. So what happens to your payment amount going forward? Nothing! It stays the same. It's always based on your highest 35 years of work under the system, regardless of when they occur. So I said a while ago, I think good things can come to those who wait. I think good things can come to those who work as well. As long as you're working and paying into the system, there's always the possibility your benefit will go up. It's never going to go down as a result of additional earnings. All right? So I want to spend a couple of minutes now talking about spousal, divorce spousal, and survivor benefits. Three areas of huge interest these days. Let's talk about spousal benefits first. Those who've been around for a while may have read, back in the day, 10, 15 years or so ago, there are a number of different esoteric social security claiming strategies that were ways that couples could optimize or maximize their lifetime social security benefits. You may have heard about or read about these things like file and suspend, or claim some now, claim more later, or file a restricted application. All of these esoteric claiming strategies, again, were ways that couples could coordinate the filing of benefits in order to maximize their lifetime payments. These were great deals. In fact, they were such great deals that Congress eliminated them at the end of 2015 with passage of something called the Bipartisan Budget Bill of 2015. So in terms of spousal and divorce spousal benefits, those esoteric strategies are now basically long gone, hard to find, and we're back to the fundamentals. Classic, basic situation. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, these days you go to Social Security. You walk and you say, I'd like to just take my spouse's benefit and defer collecting my own to let my own grow. That's one of the things you can't do anymore. These days, when you go to Social Security inquiring about spousal benefits, the rules say you always have to take your own retirement benefit first. You have to take your own retirement benefit first. Then Social Security will explore whether you might be eligible for some type of benefit based on the work and earnings of your spouse. And what did they do? Well, here's what they do. They compare 50% of your spouse's full retirement age amount with your full retirement age amount. And if your own full retirement age amount exceeds 50% of your spouse's, that's all you collect. You collect on one or the other. But if your own is less than 50%, you always take your own, but then you're given some additional money on top of that, bringing you up to that 50% of your spouse's full retirement age benefit. Now, in order to receive that additional hunk of money though, your spouse must actually be collecting. All right, one of the old strategies, that file and suspend strategy, said that if somebody had reached full retirement age, they could apply for benefits, asked to have their payment suspended, and back in the day, Social Security could still make a spousal payment even if the worker, him or herself, was not yet collected. That was eliminated. So in order to get that additional hunk of money, your spouse must actually be collecting. So until your spouse starts to collect, you can only collect based on your own work record. In addition, you at least you can collect a spousal payment, no different than a retirement program. If you're at your full retirement age when you apply, that's when you get the full 50%. You start prior to that, you can start as early as 62, you get a reduced amount. And the third thing is 
<clears throat> with spousal benefits, the payment is based on 50% of your spouse's full retirement age amount, not necessarily 50% of what he or she might be collecting. So for example, your spouse has a full retirement age amount of 1,000, but has opted to wait until age 70 to collect, so is receiving $1,240. Your spousal payment is still gonna be based on 50% of that $1,000, not 50% of the higher amount the person's actually collecting. 50% of the full retirement age amount. All right, so key point, you collect on one or the other, whichever one is higher, you don't get both at once, and you're always required to take your own retirement benefit first. What about divorce? Well, the law allows benefit payments to be made in cases of divorce, but to be able to collect as a divorced spouse, a few conditions have to be met. First and foremost, marriage must have lasted at least 10 years prior to the divorce, right? For regular spousal benefits, you just need to have been married one year. But with divorced spousal benefits, you need to have been married at least 10 years prior to the divorce. Second, to collect as a divorced spouse, you cannot be married, all right? Your ex can have remarried without impacting your ability to collect on your ex, but you cannot be married. Thirdly, you have to be at least age 62. Earliest age a divorced spouse can collect, no different than regular spousal benefits. Now, I mentioned that if the marriage were intact, you couldn't collect any type of spousal money unless and until your spouse was actually collecting. But law is a little more generous in case of divorce and says, as long as you and your ex are both 62 or older and the divorce was finalized at least two years ago, you can potentially collect divorce spousal benefits even if your ex has not yet started to collect. So those conditions being met, what are you going to be receiving? Well, simple. It's if the marriage were still intact. You always take your own retirement benefit first. If it's more than 50% of your exes, well, you just collect on your own. But if it's less than 50% of your exes, full retirement age amount, you get your own and some additional money on top of that. All right? The other thing that's great is, under the law, divorce spousal benefits are treated absolutely, totally, completely, independently of anyone else in the record. So your ex could have a whole series of 10-year marriages. You and each of the others could collect without impacting anyone else in the record. All right, divorced spousal benefits. Yeah. That 10 year, is that retroactive or does it start? So, so you were divorced 20 years ago. So is that one year? What Social, Secur no, what Social Security looks at is the date, the marriage certificate, the date the divorce decree became final. As long as there's 10 years that elapsed in that period of time, you meet that 10-year qualification. That can have occurred 20, 30 okay, so years ago, okay, so but as long as there's that 10-year duration. Okay. All right, so let's talk about survivor benefits, payments for widows and widowers. Here the news is actually a little bit better. With spousal and divorce spousal benefits, your payment's based on 50% of your ex's or your spouse's <coughs> full retirement age amount. But in cases of survivor benefits, you'll be eligible to collect 100% of the amount your deceased spouse was collecting at the time he or she passed away, or would have been collecting had they started drawing benefits that month. Well, yes, still, or your own, one or the other at a time. You never get both at once. So for example, you're getting $800 a month, your spouse is getting $1,000 a month, your spouse passes away. Well, you'll now be eligible to receive an additional $200 a month moving you from your own benefit to the $1,000 your now deceased spouse had been collecting. That's the good news. Bad news. Well, you're both alive in our example. You're getting $1,800 a month in Social Security benefits, right? Mm -hmm. Passes away. Your individual benefit goes up. But as if your old payment goes away because you collect one amount to the other at a time, you don't continue to get both at once. So it's just something you need to plan for. The other point I want to make, though, is this. Your spouse, full retirement age amount 1,000 at 67, has opted to wait till 70 to collect, so at the time he or she passes away, is receiving that $1,240 a month. Well, better news for you is your $800 benefit now increases past 1,000, all the way up to the 1,240 you're now to see spouse have been collecting. Mm -hmm. Just keep in mind in deciding when to start to draw your own retirement benefit. Remember that by starting sooner, your own benefit is lower than it would be if you waited. And any survivor payment that could be made upon your passing is going to be lower as well. But by waiting, your own benefit's higher, 
as is any survivor benefit that could be made upon your passing. Just something to keep in mind. Another reason why it's sometimes said to think good things come to those who wait. A couple other points, we'll take questions. When you're little realtors, you can start to collect a little bit sooner, as early as age 60, but same rules hold. You start to collect prior to your full retirement age, you get less, permanently reduced. But the third bullet is a key one, to distinguish survivor benefits from spousal benefits and divorce spousal benefits. As I mentioned, with survivor benefits, well, with spousal and divorce spousal benefits, you always have to take your own first. But with survivor benefits, you have the option of taking one payment amount and then switching to the other at a later date, sequencing the collection, if you will. So for example, widow at age 60 could opt to collect a reduced survivor benefit, collect, 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 and then at full retirement age, for example, switch over, you get to collect a full unreduced retirement benefit, and the fact he or she had been collecting this reduced survivor benefit doesn't preclude them from getting a full unreduced retirement benefit. Now, you don't collect both at the same time. It's always one or the other, but you can sequence the collection. Take on one account and then switch to the other, and the folks at Social Security can help you figure out, run the numbers, figure out which way makes the most sense. But keep this in mind. Whether we're talking about a retirement benefit, spousal benefit, divorce spousal benefit, or survivor benefit, if you're under your full retirement age and working, you're subject to that earnings limitation that you just showed you a few slides ago. So a widow at age 60, working, making a half a million dollars a year, she's not gonna be able to receive anything. Not because she's not old enough, not because she's not a widow, but because while she's under her full retirement age, that earnings limitation comes into play. But again, it goes away at full retirement age. You had a question in the back. You may, you may have answered it, but maybe not. Um, if I, I did. Not claimed, Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> if I have not filed for our full retirement age, and I'm going to wait till my full retirement age, yep. and something happens to me, and does my widow receive it immediate, or she has to wait until my full retirement age to get what I would have gotten? So, she has some options. Let's start with her benefit amount as a widow is gonna be based on 100% of the amount you would have received had you started collecting benefits the month you passed away. All right, so full retirement age is 67, you intend to wait until age 70, you die at 68, all right? Her payment is gonna be based on your age 68 benefit. And that 8% delayed retirement credit increase that you've been accruing, while you never personally benefit, does result and a higher survivor benefit for her. So it's 100% of what you're collecting or would have been collecting had you started the month you passed away. Now, does she have to take it then? Absolutely not. So she's 64 or something like that, still working, very happy. She could collect her own or whatever and then wait to switch to yours. So she's not forced to take it, but the benefit is going to be 100% of the amount you have been collecting or would have been collecting had you Start receiving benefits the month of that's away. Good? All right. Yeah, thank you. Just one quick question. If I can just go back to supposed to benefit. Sure. So if, if someone doesn't take this, their benefit until age 68 or 69, 70, your spouse's benefit, no matter how much you've increased that 8% a year, stays back at that when you reach your full retirement age. Correct. 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 So right. there's no benefit. There's a, only a benefit to you, not a benefit. Except, except, if you die, oh. you know, okay. so you're worth more to her dead. That's true for all of us, you know. All right, quick reminder about taxation of benefits. Prior to 1983, Social Security benefits are absolutely, totally, completely federal tax-free. They your Congress changed the IRS code, said if you're a higher income Social Security beneficiary, You'd be required to pay federal income tax for the portion of the payments <coughs> excuse me, that you had received in the prior year. How did they define higher income back in 1983? Well, they said if you're a single tax filer, you had something called modified adjusted gross income in excess of $25,000, couple filing jointly, in excess of $32,000, then you'd be required to pay federal income tax on a portion of the benefits that you would have received in the prior year. Here we are, 40 years later, those thresholds haven't been indexed. So now, if you've got 
Finally, a joint tax return, you and your spouse have a modified adjusted gross income consists of three things. Your adjusted gross income, 50% of your social security benefits, and any tax-free interest you might have received in the prior year. Add those three things up. You're now going to be in position, depending on how much more you have in income, of having to pay federal income tax on up to 85% of the payments that you had received in the prior year. 15% of what you get is always federal tax free, but up to 85% treated as ordinary income, taxed at whatever marginal tax rate you're at. End of the year, Social Security sends you 1099 form. Use that in filing a tax return. These days, about half of all Social Security beneficiaries do find themselves paying federal tax on a portion of the payments they've received. Question often comes up, well, does Social Security automatically withhold a portion of my benefits every month and send it to the IRS in advance like they do for my salary? The answer is no, they don't do it automatically. But if you'd <coughs> like to have it done at your request, Social Security will withhold a portion of your benefits. Send it off to the IRS in advance may avoid the need of you having to file quarterly estimates, depending on other sources. Now, this is federal tax rules which apply regardless of where you live. As far as state taxation of benefits goes, the good news is the vast majority of states, 38 out of the 50 states, do not tax Social Security benefits at the state level, including here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. All right? Social Security benefits state tax-free. But that leaves 12 states that do. Here in New England, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Vermont do tax Social Security benefits at the state level. Uh, just a caution. If you move out of Massachusetts upon retirement, just double check with the state taxing authority where you reside to see whether you may be required to pay state income tax on a portion of your benefits. But again, the vast majority of the states, 38 out of the 50, do not. And it's only 12 that do. All right, so you've reached the end of your rope. Like Roberto Duran. No buzz. I quit. I quit. I'm done. You've decided you're going to retire June 30th. You want to start to collect Social Security benefits effective the 1st of July. What do you do? Well, first and foremost, understand Social Security can accept an application for benefits a maximum of three months in advance of the month you want to start to collect. So you want to start to collect effective with the month of July. It means any point after April 1st, you can file an application for retirement benefits. How do you do that? Well, you've got some choices. My preferred way is to use Social Security's online retirement application. It's accessible at www.socialsecurity.gov. <clears throat> Fill out that application from the comfort and convenience of your own home, starting day or night, stopping, starting, wearing your pink footy pajamas. Yeah. Probably, you know. <laughs> Key thing, though, is to use the online retirement application, you do need to have established a My Social Security account for yourself in advance. So another reason why you should do that now. That allows you to use the online retirement application. Also like to remind folks, every online application is reviewed by a human being. Too many people say, well, what if I make a mistake? That's why they ask for contact information. So if you're not comfortable, though, dealing online, contact Social Security. Set up an appointment. You can either visit a local office or Set up an appointment for what they call a teleclaim, and they'll call you at the appointed hour to complete the application with you. So you get some options there, too. But again, a maximum of three months in advance of the month you want to start to collect. But another important point, Social Security benefits go out one month in arrears, meaning you want to start collecting effective with the month of July, you'll see your July Social Security payment sent to you in August. All right, your July payment sent to you in August. But wait, there's more. Back in the day, everybody collecting Social Security benefits get paid on the third day of the month, the check day at the bank. Jim, back in 1887, <laughs> check day at the bank. Well, since 1997, though, payment dates have been staying through the course of the month based on somebody's date of birth. And what the rules say is if your date of birth is between the first and the tenth of the month in which you were born, you will always have your payment direct deposited in your bank account on the second Wednesday of the month, regardless of the date. If your birthday falls between the 11th and the 20th of the month you were born, always have your payment direct deposited on the third Wednesday of the month, 
And if your birthday falls between the 21st and the end of the month in which you're born, payment will always be direct deposit on the 4th. Wednesday of the month, regardless of the date. So, you're retiring June 30th. You want to start to collect, effective with July. Your date of birth is the 28th. You'll see your first Social Security payment on the 4th Wednesday of August. All right? So, just something you need to plan for. Because as the great philosopher Belichick says, it is what it is. All right? <laughs> deal with it. Deal with it. All right. Like Lady Godiva, I must come to my clothes. Oh, come on, that's a funny line. I know, funny. I know, I deal with younger folks, they have no idea who Lady Godiva is. I was like, and where I started, though, we'll open up to questions. Finally important, you've got to understand the program never intended to be your only source of income in retirement, always intended to provide that base, foundation of income. But the sooner you recognize that, work with Jim and Eric to find ways you can move what Social Security provides, the more likely you are to have that comfortable retirement. So I hope the information has been helpful to you. Obviously, you get copies of the slides. But are there questions I can help you with um, that may not have come up? I don't see any, so I can try. <laughs> yes, sir. Just one little question. When, so, but hit first, then you. I'm trying to figure out in my head, and like you said a couple of times, it's your choice. Correct. So, but does it become a choice when, for instance, you're 68 years old, for instance, and you haven't collected, okay? And hypothetically, you're collecting, say, $4,000 a month. Mm -hmm. 8% <laughs> next year brings you maybe three more hundred dollars, 8% next year, you're not there. So doing the math, it just doesn't seem to make sense to wait, because you're doing that $48,000 that you, you get versus how long is it going to take to recover that $48,000 over the course of time? I don't know. Sure. That's, and that's why I never tell people what they should right. do. Exactly. But, but let me give you know. a very right. oversimplified, break-even calculation, right? Because I get this all the time. We've got two people, both of whom have a full retirement age of 67, both of whom at full retirement age of 67 would get $1,000 per month. First person says, I want to start at 67. Second person says, I want to wait until age 70 to start to collect. Now, we'll oversimplify it because we won't factor in colas, but colas would lift all boats equally. But if you think about it, this first person then, between 67 and 70, will have received $1,000 a month for 36 months, therefore will have banked $36,000 in Social Security benefits, but continues to just get that $1,000 a month. Second person, between 67 and 70, nothing, but at 70 starts to collect $1,240 per month, or $240 more than that first person. So the question is, at $240 more per month, how long does it take this second person to make back the $36,000 that the first person had collected? It's simple math, it's 150 months or 12 and a half years, or until age 82 and a half. That's why I always say, it's a very simple decision. You just need one piece of information. When are you gonna die? <laughs> With that piece of information, it all falls into place. But why is it about a 12 year break even point? Because back when Congress set those rates, that was average life expectancy for somebody at full retirement age, about 12 years, designed to be actuarily neutral, but it's basically a 12-year break. No matter what two points you pick, that's why it's your choice. I never tell people. Because here's the other thing. You're never going to know what the absolute correct decision was until after you're dead. <laughs> and at that point, it's not going to matter. <laughs> yes, sir? It won't tell the wife. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's important. <laughs> Get a food taster, let me just say that. <laughs> the pension and the windfall elimination provision. Yep. Is it, and I, I is there, I, the way I understand it is they can take up to two thirds your social security money away, or could it actually be all of it? <laughs> okay, so there are two provisions of the Social Security <laughs> Act that impact people who receive a public pension, which is based on work not covered under Social Security. 
Here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, state and local employees don't pay into Social Security. Teachers don't pay into Social Security. You get a pension, either a Mass Teachers Retirement System pension or a state or local pension where you haven't been paying into the Social Security program. That will call into play windfall elimination provision and or government pension offset. But we need to deal with them separately. The windfall provision. That impacts you if you get that public pension, again, based on work not covered under Social Security. But in addition to your public service, have worked and paid into the Social Security program for at least 10 years. You've earned your 40 Social Security credits. <clears throat> the good news is, as long as you have those 10 years of time under Social Security, those 40 credits, you will absolutely, positively get something each and every month from Social Security even if you get that public pension, all right? You're always gonna get something. That's the good news. The bad news is, in all likelihood, the amount you get each month from Social Security is gonna be less than it would be if you didn't have that public pension. Because of the windfall provision, law requires Social Security to use a different and admittedly less generous formula to calculate the amount of your Social Security benefit, but you're always going to get something. And in fact, excuse me, the more time you had under Social Security, the less of an impact that public pension has. And in fact, you end up with 30 or more years where you've worked and paid into Social Security, then that public pension becomes immaterial. And you receive a full, normal, regular Social Security payment each and every month in addition to the public pension. But with fewer than 30 years of time under Social Security, receipt of that public pension means you're gonna get less each month than you'd receive if you didn't get the pension, because Social Security has to use a different formula to calculate the amount of your benefit. Maximum reduction in somebody's full retirement age benefit this year because of the receipt of the pension is to lower it by $557 a month. That's the worst that can happen, all right? There are online calculators on the Social Security website that you can use. You plug in your earnings, plug in the amount of your pension, they'll give you a benefit estimate back. And that's, news that, that's accurate? That, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they get the squirrels running right now. <laughs> no, you did it, and I was a little surprised. It came out a lot higher than I thought. Yeah. So I, I, I don't believe it all. Okay. <laughs> Tell you what. Tell you what. You give me what it says. <laughs> all right. So that's the windfall provision. That impacts you if you get the public pension. It impacts how much you can collect based on your own work record. The other provision, government pension offset. That impacts you if you get that public pension, but now we're looking to collect benefits as a spouse, divorced spouse, or widower, widower. And here, the news is not as good, because under the government pension offset rules, Social Security is required to reduce any type of money you might be able to collect as a spouse, divorced spouse, or widower, widower, by two-thirds of the amount of your pension, all right? So, you always get your own, but you get your own benefit, but then you potentially do some additional money up to, say, the spouse is alive, that up to 50%. It's this additional hunk of money that government pension offset impacts, and that additional hunk of money gets reduced by two-thirds of the amount of your pension. So if two-thirds of your monthly pension exceeds that additional hunk of money you could collect, well, you don't get anything more from Social Security. You get your own benefit, you get your public pension, but you're not eligible for anything more as a spouse, a divorced spouse, or survivor. Why does government pension offset exist? Well, I talked about it. You collect on one amount or the other at a time. If you've worked under Social Security, you don't get both at once. Prior to government pension offset, public employees were able to get a full pension and full spousal benefits, whereas somebody who worked under Social Security, you get one or the other, whichever one is higher. So with the windfall, you always get something, but with government pension offset, depending on the amount of your pension, you may not be able to get anything more on your spouse, ex-spouse, or deceased spouse. All right? What else? That doesn't affect regular pensions. Right? It's only a pension based on work not covered under Social Security. Absolutely. Yeah, General Motors pension or things like that. Stone and Bank pension. <laughs> yeah. On the, wind, the windfall scenario, if someone is under the windfall and their spouse myself passes away 
do they get affected? Like, do they not get online because they came under the windfall? To so who gets the public pension? Head Northeast. Uh, spouse. Spouse, right. So now you pass away. Right. She's potentially eligible for a widow's benefit equal to 100% of the amount you were collecting the month you passed away. Except Social Security, before they pay her that, they'll figure out what two-thirds of her pension is and reduce anything she could collect on you by that two-thirds of her pension. Because of the windfall. No, that's government pension offset. Okay. All right. Same, same concept, but okay. GPO impacts spousal, divorce spousal, and survivor benefits. The windfall, that impacts your own retirement payment. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I had a family member, when she signed up for Medicare, she was still working. Did not want her Social Security, mm -hmm. but they started sending her her Social Security checks when she signed up for Medicare. Do you have to be really specific when you sign up for Medicare that whether or not you want your Social Security to start then? Well, there are ways you can, there's an online application for Medicare only, mm -hmm. and that's the one you need to be careful and fill out, because if you fill out that application for Medicare only, they won't start your payments. Now, she can undo what she's done. You know, if she doesn't want the money, just call up Social Security and say, hey, you messed up here, and uh, pay it back, no interest charge, and uh, mm -hmm. be like it's never occurred, she'll just have her Medicare eligible. Okay, thank you. Yep. That's her one shot to give it back. No, that'll, that'll be different. She's not withdrawing her application, not saying I completely changed my mind. It's, you know, you misinterpreted what I want. Oh, I got okay. that, that type of thing, you know, with Social Security's mistake, as opposed to somebody completely changing her. Yeah? I'm not sure if this is, you can answer this, but we'll try. Would it be uh, a good idea to file your income taxes separately if one spouse is full retirement and the other is not, in order to avoid paying all those that money in? Great question, and the answer is no, because if you're fi married filing separately, the threshold is zero, mm -hmm. and any income you have above zero is subject to social, is, your social security benefits get subject to tax. They've written in, they they anticipated that, and so lower the threshold <laughs> okay. zero. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you start getting your benefits. Yeah. There's no limit on the income that you um, can earn. Yeah. But, of course, my birthday is in January 1st, so what happens when my benefits kick in in May? So am I limited to the income I make in January 1st? So, you reach your full retirement age in May, is that what you're saying? Yep. Okay. I, actually, you're, yes, it, it's actually April, but... Okay, okay. So the question is, can I collect for the months, Jan so beginning the month you hit your full retirement age, yep. on, you can collect even if you're working making a million dollars a year. Okay. The question is, are you able to collect anything from January, February, and March, if, if you choose to? And the law says that year you hit your full retirement age, you're, it's a more generous test, more than the 21, it's 56. So if you're earning during that period of time or under that, higher limit. From, you, from January to May, let's say. No, 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 no. To when you're full, beginning the month you hit your full retirement age, you're off to the races. Okay. It's January through the month before you reach your full retirement age. Okay. And during that period of time, if your earnings are under that allowed, okay, you can- 56. Correct. Okay. You, wait a minute. You can collect if you choose to, but by starting early, your payment's going to be reduced. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Kind of on the same note, the uh, bullet point you had above, say you make $50,000 for the year and you wanted to um, be under full retirement age slide. Yep. Yep. So say you make 50000 and in June you decide you want to retire, so you pay twenty five. would you get, and then you apply, would you get taxed that one for Every two with that Great, point. good question. And if I had the full eight hours, I'd have covered that. <laughs> <laughs> Your first year of retirement, all right, is also a more generous test put into place, recognizing situations like that, that somebody could work like crazy first half of the year and then look to retire and collect for the rest of the year. And what the law says, and again, it's only during your first year of retirement, all right? And we'll say you're retiring July 1st, 
right? Between January 1st and June 30th, you can make a million dollars. You can then collect July through the end of the year for each month that your earnings are $1,770 or less, all right? So that's that first year of retirement, post your month of retirement, you can make a little bit, as long as you hold it under that amount. You can collect regardless of what your earnings had been prior to retiring. Okay. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric, but I'm gonna hang around and take some uh, questions at the end if you have. So thanks for your time, hope it's helpful. Thank you very much. Again, we're so we're so glad you all made it. And again, trying to do this from uh, maybe a quarterly, um, every several months through the banks. Um, but again, just the education and the importance. And we're just we're just glad that uh, nine telephone poles didn't fall down on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> all get in here this evening. So this is a great turnout, and we so appreciate it. Um, Jim, anything to add? No. Oh, if, if there's a question here and it wasn't answered or, or comes up afterward. Um, reach out to Eric or I, and we'll try to help you. We have resources to help find particular situations, and everybody has a different situation. Yeah. Birthdays, yeah. spouses, all that, pensions, not pensions. So uh, reach out to us, and we'll try to get you an answer. Do you have a, do you have a, a typical, uh, I mean, a seminar similar to this for uh, Medicare? Well, we're actually, we actually did do one. Yeah, it's kind of online during COVID, and we're gonna we're gonna do a we're gonna do that a live event with the same thing. We'll do, and I'll get that we'll get that date out. Again, this is really through the bank tonight. But as Jim was saying, you know, if we can help, as Kurt mentioned a couple times, those gaps. Again, we're here. Just we want to make sure, from a wealth management standpoint, we can provide any. Um, additional guidance, we'd be glad to do that, all right? So, um, but most importantly, I do have a, uh, uh, a gift card here for uh, one lucky person because we all know we need some social security right now to pay for a bag of groceries. So, do, do we have a Nancy Yo? All right. Bags of groceries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much. And please grab some food on the way out.